Good evening, everyone. How are you? I'm Jackie Terraza. I'm the Women's Board Endowed Chair of Museum Education, and it's really a pleasure to welcome you to the first of what will be four talks about aspects of American art supported by the Terra Foundation uh, for American Art, who has been our partner in this series, and we're very grateful for their support. And the first is tonight, and the last one is on June 10, and if you turn to the back of your programs, you'll see the rest of the series there. This program is also part of a very exciting and much larger citywide celebration of public art in the city, organized by the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. And this series brings together artists and organizations from across the city to really reflect on and discuss and explore and you know, just really consider the role of public art, what it means in our lives, in our city. So today the focus is the rich history of public sculpture in Chicago, and the Art Institute is, is a great place to do that. We have a great collection of works related to that. And so we've invited a set of panelists um, to discuss uh, public sculpture in Chicago. We have Amanda Duberly from the uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. We have Julia Backrack, a historian for the Chicago Park District. And we have artist Tony Tassett, who is an artist in the museum's collection and also teaches at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And I'm very uh, glad that moderating the conversation is the Chicago Tribune's uh, Rick Kogan. So each panelist will speak for about five to 10 minutes, and then Rick Kogan will lead a conversation among all of the participants. And then after the conversation, if you're interested, uh, please join Amanda Duverly for a 30-minute uh, tour of the works uh, that are on view uh, in the museum that are maquettes for public sculptures in the city. And if you're interested in joining the tour, all you have to do is to just uh, meet us at the bottom of the grand staircase just outside of this hall and uh, join the group there. So before I uh, turn over the mic, please make sure to silence your cell phones. And uh, thanks again for joining us this evening. Thanks, thanks very much. Okay. So uh, the mid 20th century was an extraordinary time for public sculpture uh, in Chicago with numerous works by so-called modern masters installed downtown. And we often think of the Chicago Picasso as initiating this great era of public sculpture, but I'd like to draw your attention to another key work, uh, Richard Lippold's Radiant Eye. It's just a few blocks away, you might have seen it. <laughs> Uh, it's in the lobby of the Inland Steel Building at Dearborn and Monroe, uh, and it set an important precedent for commissioning abstract sculpture for modern architecture. So I'll talk about the sculpture briefly, uh, and then pull three threads uh, from Inland Steel that illuminate the longer history of Chicago's modern public sculpture. Radiant Eye was commissioned by the Inland Steel Company for its headquarters building, designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, and completed in 1958. So the building was a feat of engineering with the longest clear span of any office building ever built. And as Lee Block, the Inland Steel Company vice president in charge of the building project, told Time Magazine, quote, we wanted a building to, we could be proud of, one that spelled steel, end quote. So in addition to structural innovations, indeed, looking towards the building uh, from Dearborn Street, we catch the gleaming stainless steel of its cladding, essentially a, a billboard size uh, sign for the company product. So SOM used sculpture to identify the building at the scale of the pedestrian. And traditionally, the lower floors of office buildings contained interior arcades that were promenades with shops serving workers and the public. So SOM turned this concept inside out at Inland Steel. The shops were eliminated, and the public amenity became open space around the building. So the lobby, in turn, became a space of display with a luminous ceiling that dematerialized glass walls both day and night. 
So Lippold, who studied industrial design at the School of the Art Institute and would become known during the 1960s and 70s for his soaring metal sculptures at Lincoln Center and the National Air and Space Museum, designed Radiant Eye specifically for the lobby. He called it Radiant Eye for inland and the personal pronoun since he thought it marked a transition from the scale of the building to the scale of the human body. He also viewed the sculpture as evocative of birth, uh, the forming processes of all living things. He, uh, as a symbol of steel, the sculpture arguably surpassed even the spectacular display of stainless steel in the building's cladding. Its gleaming, gravity-defying appearance in the building lobby dramatizing Inland's product to great effect. So it served dual roles as an example of modernist sculpture and as a tool of corporate public relations. So my first thread is William Hartman, a partner in SOM's Chicago office and the architect who worked closely with Block and his wife, Mary Lasker, on the Lobby Sculpture Commission. Now, as prominent collectors who gave their name to the Art Museum at Northwestern University, as well as many works of art to the Art Institute, the Blocks were certainly not reluctant patrons. But Hartman had a role to play, too, as a champion of art in modern architecture. Hartman was an art collector and sat on the Art Institute's 20th Century Committee for Painting and Sculpture, as well as its board. He joined SOM in 1945 and was instrumental in selecting artists for the firm's first major building to include commissioned art, the Terrace Plaza Hotel in Cincinnati, a project that featured a mural by Juan Miro, as well as a mobile by Alexander Calder, among other works. And Hartman, of course, recruited Miro to design a sculpture for uh, Chicago that was belatedly installed in the 1980s. So the architect really believed that modern architecture should incorporate great art. And the reason for this was largely based in the aesthetics of the building. As he told Betty Blum for the Chicago Architects Oral History Project in 1989, quote, the modern architecture that we identified with eliminated decoration. Basically, it was an evolution from a handicraft kind of building technology to an industrialized building technology. That was the key to it. When you gave up the handicraft part, you gave up the artisan and the craftsman who would carve limestone and wood and these different materials that led to the expression of a building. In industrialized architecture, you were using components that were made by machine, and decoration wasn't appropriate for the machine. So when you come to decorate an industrialized building, you decorate with an artist. At Inland Steel, art was featured inside the building. For the civic projects that occupied Hartman during the 1960s, sculpture was sited outdoors, where its size increased dramatically. The architect spearheaded negotiations with Pablo Picasso for the Civic Center sculpture, famously tempting the artist with gifts on frequent visits. On his trips to Europe to see Picasso and Miro, Hartman also traveled to see Alexander Calder, guiding to completion La Grande Vitesse, the first sculpture commissioned by the Federal Art and Public Places program. It stands outside of city and county buildings designed by SOM in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm sure Hartman would demur, but I really wonder if any of this would have happened the way it did without him. Second thread, Dearborn Street. This is the location of the Inland Steel Building. It is also the spine of urban renewal in downtown Chicago, connecting the great open spaces proposed in the city's 1958 development plan. The Civic Center on the northern end of the loop and the Federal Center on the southern end and then with First National Plaza in the middle. Inland Steel, in effect, kicked off Chicago's loop urban renewal with a flourish. The building opened the same year that the development plan was issued. It was hoped that federal and municipal investment in downtown through the civic and government centers would encourage other companies to follow Inland's lead, generating much needed tax revenue through demolition of rundown older buildings followed by new construction. 
urban renewal quite literally cleared the way for civic sculpture, which would be sited in large plazas that provided much needed open space in the congested heart of the loop. Hartman looked to Europe for examples and complained that American cities had been taken over by commercial symbols. Yet the sort of corporate imaging we saw at Inland Steel seems relevant to the Civic Center too, where the practice of public relations was extended to include the image of the city. Indeed, in a 1968 article addressed to the sculpture entitled pa Pablo's What's It is One Year Old, the Tribune reported with pride how the Picasso had brought prestige to Chicago, primarily through the circulation of its image. Quote, Picasso is said to be pleased with the way your image is grabbing hold here and throughout the world. William Hartman visits your creator often and reports he thinks you looked great on the telephone directory. He's also delighted with your likeness on ashtrays, cufflinks, pajamas, plates, and other items, end quote. The Chicago Picasso certainly complemented the Corten steel-clad Civic Center building as decoration, and without a doubt, it is great art. But it also became a symbol of the city as its image circulated through various media, a what's-it made legible through the language of public relations. Third and final thread, abstraction. Promoters of the new public sculpture, which is largely abstract, often contrasted it with the monuments of the previous century. This was a different kind of public art, they declared, an art that shrugged off the didacticism of more traditional public monuments. Instead, on offer was art by the greatest contemporary artists, an idea codified by the Federal Art and Public Places program when it forbade com commemorative content of any sort. On one hand, abstraction was a necessary accommodation to the cultural relativism of the post-war period. Confidence that a broad audience would understand the allegorical symbolism of traditional monuments was long gone. On the other, it was an accommodation to the architecture that these sculptures decorate, not only in terms of its abstraction, but also its scale. The transition between the scale of the building and the scale of the human body, so central to Lippold's sculpture at Inland Steel, applies here at the Civic Center as well. The difference is one of magnitude. The Civic Center building is 648 feet tall. The Chicago Picasso, 50 feet. The statue of Ernie Banks, once proposed as a replacement, would have had a completely different relationship to the international style tower behind it, dwarfed along with the viewer by a 31-story office tower. And of course, we got a chance to actually experience this when the 2008 bronze of Ernie Banks was moved to Daly Plaza temporarily. Now, abstract sculpture does not necessarily convey a particular message, as with an allegorical sculpture or a statue of Ernie Banks, but its abstraction affords it another purpose. It readily acts as a container to be filled with the memories and associations of passers-by. Within the urban environment, we might say that the new public art of the mid-20th century functions as a landmark. As such, it becomes meaningful, perhaps not even as art but through the viewer's experience of it in relation to its site. The Inland Steel Corporation is long gone, but Radiant Eye remains in the lobby of the building at the corner of Dearborn and Monroe. Thank you. Okay, yay. Um, so I'm not known for speaking in a very brief way, and I'm gonna do my best here, and got fun timing me, but basically um, what I wanted to do is to show a very kind of visual timeline of the amazing collection of public art that we have in um, Chicago's parks and green spaces. And um, so the, in kind of the story almost sort of tells itself, but I wanted to start with one of the earliest pieces, which is the alarm, which was a gift of Martin Ryerson. And, um, he wanted to commemorate, um, he had really great reverence for the Native Americans who had already been completely pushed out of um, our region by that 
time. And you can see just the tremendous kind of sense of respect that this Native American family is given. And it's called the alarm because there's a sense of, you know, something is, um, some type, something fearful is happening. And of course, um, we know that they were treated in a way where being fearful was an appropriate response. But it's just a lovely family and a very humanistic portrayal, 1884. And then uh, 1887, we have the standing Lincoln in Lincoln Park. And of course, this was a really important um, piece for Augusta St. Gaudens. There had been the recent discovery of the um, life mask, the, the mold of Lincoln's face and hands that had been missing. Um, and so he was able to use them. He took this this commission so seriously that he went to find a village in New Hampshire where there were men with the proper physique and he found the perfect model who would represent um, the very lanky body of President Lincoln. And then of course, it's you know so grand on the Stanford White Exedra um, and really considered one of the great Lincolns that uh, exists and it was copied in a couple other, used in a couple other cities. And then, um, of course, we had the World's Columbian Exposition and the whole impact of the World's Fair on art. And um, one of the things that I find really fascinating is that Jens Jensen, the famous prairie style landscape architect, um, was very concerned about the proper placement and type and placement of sculpture in the landscape. And so um, he was able to get plaster versions of maquettes of pieces that had been in the exposition. So these are these World Fair Bison by Edward Kemys. Of course, you probably all know that he also did the lions in front of the Art Institute. And so there were massive versions of these near the stock exhibit at the fair. Um, and so um, in 1908, Jensen had these little plaster versions of sculptures that had been at the fair. And um, there were many of them throughout the parks. And he was experimenting with where the proper placement of such artworks should go. And he said he didn't want to see any um, frock-coated war heroes prancing through the parks. The thing that I find so fascinating um, is that when Jensen, they had that, for both the original plaster works, which were actually first in another garden, and then they'd sort of switch the locations. And then these bronze versions that were installed in 1911, notice how you see the back end of the Bison. So Jensen wanted you to experience them from within the garden. Um, also as part of one of these outdoor art exhibits, um, Jensen had a young sculptor. You may not know him because he died really young. His name was Charles Mulligan. And Jensen really, really loved his work. Always very kind of humanistic portrayal. And here, this is kind of fun to contrast with the other Lincoln. Um, Lincoln, the rail splitter, really focusing on Lincoln's very humble beginnings when he, in fact, did work as a rail splitter. And even just the way that it's installed on that kind of simple, um, almost kind of boulder base. But this was also originally done just as a plaster temporary piece, and then people loved it, so then it was cast in bronze. That's quite a contrast to the Goethe monument in Lincoln Park. And this was done, there was a big competition. There were dozens and dozens of different artists that um, participated in the competition, a big committee that decided. But um, you can see that, of course, this probably isn't what Goethe looked like. It's <laughs> a very heroic kind of um, representation of honoring Goethe's memory. And of course, a lot of German organizations and civic groups were involved. Now, that was 1913. Now, here we are in 1915. This was a super, super controversial commission. First of all, Altgeld was a very controversial guy. He was actually a wonderful man, but he took a lot of heat for pardoning the Haymarket rioters. And so that had happened years earlier, but he still, you know, his reputation was still sort of in question. And a lot of people who realized how important Altgeld was, and he was a great reformer and things, um, wanted to have a monument to him. And so there was a lot of controversy about how he should be portrayed. This, of course, was a commission that went to Gutzon Borglum, the same sculptor who did Mount Rushmore. And a lot of people first, you know, ended up really criticizing this piece because it's, 
it's so humanistic, it's small, and then the way that the people, the family, the children are kind of clutching his coat. Um, but I really think it's very sweet. And it's nestled into the landscape, but um, unfortunately, it looks so naturalistic that somebody came along at the park district and planted a lot of trees in front of it. So you may not know this piece, but it is worth visiting for sure. Now here we are only three years later, and it's now the centennial of Illinois statehood. And so um, the Illinois Centennial Monument um, was the monument to mark this important occasion. And I, I wanted to include this both because it's so architectural, it's quite a contrast to what we have just seen. Also, I, I think it's really great that the team of Henry Bacon and Evelyn Beatrice Longman um, also did the Lincoln Monument in Washington. And plus, we don't have that many women sculptors early on in um, the history of Chicago art. And then, of course, the famous Fountain of Time in Washington Park by Laredo Taft. Now, that was completed in 1922, but he spent more than a decade on this. And, and then he was sort of criticized because by the sort of mid-20s, people started thinking about, you know, more about deco and sort of more modernistic kinds of artworks and people were thinking this was old-fashioned but it's really quite an amazing work of art it's made out of exposed aggregate concrete it's got a hundred figures that are kind of struggling forward in this sort of great wave of humanity while father time watches on and I don't know if you can see the three girls under the cloaks but those are his daughters and a lot of his students also he's in the back you can actually find him a self-portrait but a lot of his students are also were models for this artwork and then of course in 1927 the iconic Buckingham fountain the gift of Miss Kate Buckingham that she asked how much do you think it'll cost to have this monumental fountain which ended up being put in place of where they wanted the Field Museum, but they needed to keep the views open because of Montgomery Ward's lawsuits. And she, they told her about $300,000. And by the end, they got over a million dollars out of Miss Buckingham. It turned out to be quite an expensive piece, but a really important work of art for Chicago. And I just love how it's you know so French and it's often compared to the Latona Basin in Versailles but you're getting this sort of Beaux-Arts carved elements of the fountain by Edward Bennett juxtaposed to these wonderful Art Deco seahorses by Marcel Loyou. And then another Art Deco fantastic monument in Chicago that you may not know because it's in Mar Marquette Park was um, a monument to two Lithuanian flyers who um, crashed in um, the 1930s just a couple, like few hundred miles sh shy of their um, intended, they were trying to make it to Lithuania. And um, it, so the, it was a commission that was only allowed to go to Lithuanian um, uh, designer, architect. And so that was the architecture firm. And then this fantastic um, French sculptor, um, Raul Josette, did the bronze. And y you can see there's this great kind of grill work um, and then this globe where it actually shows you the, the actual map of where the um, plane actually flew. And Josette had done some work at the um, 1933 Century of Progress. And then he went to Texas, and there's all this wonderful artwork that nobody knows about of his still in Texas. And then in 1949, and this was a piece that actually would have been installed earlier, but it was delayed by because of, um, of construction delays during World War II, we have Alban Polacek's um, Thomas Masaryk monument, and again, this is an allegorical piece. It represents a Czech um, knight, and of course, Thomas Masaryk was teaching at the U of C at the time, which is nearby. We're on the Midway now, and he led the movement for Czech independence. And that was 1949 when it was installed, and it's it's really quite um, handsome, very you know heroic, allegorical, and then. You know, it's interesting, Amanda just gave us this important moment of the 60s, but there's nothing in the Chicago parks until 1981 when we get Ellsworth Kelly's Curve 22, which we in Chicago call I Will because that's the Chicago motto. This great, very abstract stainless steel um, um, kind of obelisk. And then um, Richard Hunt's Eagle Columns. So this is the next thing that happened. You know, it's funny, there was so much public art and then this big um, period of just nothing in the parks and then it 
it's slowly eight, 1981. Then this piece, this, these, this is also dedicated to Altgeld um, called the Eagle Columns in Jonquil Park. And then of course, by the 2000s, there's lots and lots of sculptures again. And of course we have in Chicago, um, the addition of Millennium Park, which in, in a way is almost like a living artwork itself. And we have Anish Kapoor's Cloud Gate in this whole sense that people and the public want to be interactive with the sculpture. In that sense, I think also you could say applies to um, Magdalena Abakanovich's Agora, where I think there's a hundred of these um, cast iron pieces with, that are headless torsos. And of course, people like to kind of walk in between them. And of course, we also have a new collection of quite a few pieces of playground art, um, and many by the Chicago Public Art Group. This one is at Commercial Club Park, where people, and especially kids, really can climb and you know, uh, climb all over these uh, artworks. They're quite interactive. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to try to be quick um, because I love to hear Rick Kogan speak. He has such a great melodious voice. You'll see. Uh, so anyway, uh, <laughs> I feel a little pretentious. Everybody else is showing, you know, here's Picasso, and now I'm just talking about myself. But um, so I've also made some public artworks along with some other pieces. And my approach to public art, um, for one thing, was to try to speak to as big an audience as possible. Um, that sounds really straightforward and simple. Um, but I don't know, I'm, my thoughts are changing um, in response to the last two um, presentations. And I thought a lot about the, uh, I made this piece, maybe somebody saw an earlier version of this uh, for Chicago, if, for a temporary piece in Chicago. It's called Eye, it's 30 feet tall, 30 feet wide, and it is a depiction of my own eye. But I, I thought a lot about those, that Picasso and the Calder. I love those two pieces. I had to see how tall they were immediately. Um, but I also thought about, I, I guess one thought as, as I was looking at that is that I became, when I started making public art, I thought a little bit about, geez, what an egotistical move. You know, you make this gesture that's supposed to last for a while and it's addressing kind of everybody, the public. You know, that's a little different than just doing a show in a gallery or in your basement. Um, so my way of dealing with it was, you know, I'm still making the big egotistical gesture, but I'm trying to acknowledge it. So that's why, I, that's why it's my eye. So I thought it was a kind of an acknowledgement of that, of, of ego. Uh, eye is, the eye as a symbol is one of the most recognized um, uh, symbols you can have. You go back to the Pharaoh's eye or the eye on the dollar bill. It usually represents um, God or consciousness, but it's also just cool. It's what, you know, I think if you, you know, if you looked at my high school notebooks, they probably have eyes, you know, drawn in the borders and flames and arrows and things like that. Um, anyway, I got to go quicker. So this is currently, this is now in Dallas, Texas. I was given an opportunity to do a piece for Sony Entertainment in Culver City, and this is the old MGM Grand uh, studio lot. It's where The Wizard of Oz was filmed, along with Gone with the Wind, Citizen Kane. But I was a real, I, I mean, this is a real love letter for me. I grew up uh, just a geek watching television, you know, drawing and watching television. Um, my parents allowed me to watch as much TV as I wanted uh, because they loved me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, when I had this opportunity, it was just too good to be true. And watching television back then was included watching a lot of old movies. So this is a pretty straightforward piece. Um, but I did think about L.A. and, you know, the big Randy's Donut sign. I mean, there is this kitsch kind of sign quality. I was thinking about that. Or the very idea of taking something ephemeral like light, but making it a sign, making it concrete, um, kind of capturing nature, which is um, a theme. Uh, this piece is called Paul, 
And this is at Governor State Sculpture Park. This is also 30 feet tall. I made this piece, actually my wife had gotten sick and she's fine now, but personally that, that happened and we were, this was well after 9-11, and we were obviously embroiled in what seemed like um, was what has become a series of protracted wars. And somehow the optimism of a piece like the rainbow, I just couldn't muster it. So a lot of what I do is take something that already exists in the world. It's a little different than I think a lot of artists. So I thought about Paul Bunyan sculptures. That's a common rural, this is also in kind of a rural setting, un unlike the other things which were in the middle of a city. But I always thought of Paul Bunyan, and you know this mythological American kind of uh, character. I always thought him as a, as a kind of a uh, metaphor for American exceptionalism. He, and even a kind of a sign of manifest destiny. I mean, you know the stories, he kind of played with his, his uh, ox, babe, the big blue ox, and they were playing as kids, and that created the Great Lakes. And he was able to, you know, swing his ax, and that, you know, caused great uh, shifts in the landscape. So I wanted to take this kind of known American iconog iconographic symbol, but kind of make him grow up, make him over the hill. He's got a pot belly. Maybe he's got some regrets in life. Um, you know, when we, people talked a lot in the news about kind of the weight of the world on America's shoulders. So I guess this is an example that on one hand, you have the kind of the 20th century modernist examples that we've seen, which I love, but I also, um, they're, they're at least start from, an, from a position of, uh, of a modernist kind of exclusivity. It was not, it was when art was supposed to be above people, above the masses, and it was to raise them up. That's kind of a modernist idea. Then you look at earlier, 19th century, those pieces are very, very accessible. I'm not always sure about their message. So I think I combined those things and tried to use the power of accessibility, but to maybe try to say something. Did that make sense? I hope so. Um, if it didn't, maybe ask questions later. So I was thinking about King Lear and Michelangelo and Walt Disney and all of that stuff. Uh, this is kind of a different piece because I don't think it's really for everybody in some ways. It's called the Artist Monument, and it's 8 by 8 by 80 feet long, and it's etched with the names of almost 400,000 um, artists' names, which is incredibly thorough. So people who've had one exhibition in a college, you know, university gallery, they're going to be on it right next to Picasso or George O'Keefe or whoever. Uh, and, I, and they're in alphabetical order. So it's incredibly egalitarian, at least to artists. So artists come and they kind of find their, their themselves or their you know, friends and neighbors. Um, anyway, so it's, it's a little different than the other pieces. This was in Grant Park, but is actually going to uh, University of Illinois at Chicago as a permanent piece, hopefully in the spring. So this was done for the Whitney Biennial a couple years ago. Um, th this last piece, I thought I'd end in a weird place. Um, this is a proposal which I probably am not going to get. Uh, I'm not even sure I'm really supposed to be talking about this, but you know, well, I'm among friends here. I don't think I, it's not going to leave this room. So I've recently, very, very recently, was invited to make a proposal for a temporary piece for a building called the American Copper Building. It's on the Lower East Side in Manhattan, and, or Middle East Side in Manhattan. <clears throat> and it's a big, it's gonna be the biggest copper building, copper clad building in the world. And uh, I don't want, well, we, we shouldn't get into politics tonight, but I don't know if anybody's feeling a little gloomy or just a little, a little pessimistic, perhaps. So with, with that in mind, I, uh, I made this proposal for uh, two 20-foot tall crows. It's called Heckle and Jekyll. Um, and it's like, you know, like uh, a memento mori. It's supposed to just be, I mean, I think my, my work is kind of obvious. So it's just in the spectacle, in the glitz and glamour of Manhattan and in the, you know, frankly, the materialism of this 
which I'm a part of, I'm not saying I'm outside of that, I just wanted a little, you know, a little reminder of, you know, that all things must pass, ashes to ashes, kind of that, that, that was the message. Um, so that's a really bleak place to end, but that's where I'm <laughs> ending. Thank you. The reason I do these things is to meet people like this. <laughs> uh, I have a terrible admission to make. I, I have grown to love public art of all kinds. Even a kid, if they still use chalk on a sidewalk. But my first exposure to public art was a little place in Lincoln Park right in front of what I always will call the Chicago Historical Society. It's a tiny mausoleum for the Couch family. Do you, do you know this little building? I grew up in Old Town. I'm 10 years old. I go over there with four friends. And what do we do to it? The first public art piece I've ever seen. We deface it, <laughs> trying to break in with screwdrivers and hammers because we were sure that there was a treasure inside. <clears throat> I have since grown to, uh, I find all public art inspiring and thought-provoking. I was over as a young man, I was 16, standing in Daly Plaza with uh, my mentor, Mike Royko, when a certain piece of public art was displayed. This is some of what Mike Royko wrote, and I hope it tells you how public art can be inspiring but also thought-provoking. He wrote this the very day. He wrote this an hour after he saw it. I won't read the whole thing, but I will read the germane parts. Mayor Daley walked to the white piece of ribbon and put his hand on it. This was a moment to think about to savor what was about to happen. In just a moment, with the snap of the mayor's wrist, Chicago history would be changed. That's no small occurrence, the cultural rebirth of a city. Thousands waited in and around the Civic Center Plaza. Was anybody here there? Thousands of people, none of whom are here, waited in and around <laughs> the Civic Center Plaza. They had listened to the speeches about the Picasso thing. They had heard how it was going to change Chicago's image. They had heard three clergymen, a priest, a rabbi, and a Protestant minister, offer eloquent prayers. And that's probably a record for a work by Picasso, a dedicated atheist. William Hartman, the aforementioned William Hartman, the man who thought up this whole thing, told eloquently of Picasso's respect for Mayor Daley. Whenever Hartman went to visit Picasso, the artist asked, is Mayor Daley still the mayor of Chicago? <laughs> when Hartman said this, Mayor Daley bounced up and down in his chair. He laughed so hard. After the ceremony, it came to that final moment the mayor standing there holding the white ribbon, and then he pulled. There was a gasp as the light blue covering fell away in several pieces. But it was caused by the basic American fascination for any mechanical feat that goes off as planned. In an instant, <laughs> Picasso stood there, unveiled for all to see. A few people applauded, but at best it was a smattering of applause. Most of the throng was silent. <clears throat> they had hoped, you see, that it would be what they had heard it would be, a woman maybe, a beautiful, <laughs> soaring woman. That is what many art experts and enthusiasts had promised the city. Well, if it was a woman, then art experts should put away their books and spend more time in girly joints. <laughs> <laughs> The, sil yeah, the, love <laughs> the silence grew. Then people turned and looked at each other. Some shrugged, some smiled. 
Some just stood there, frowning or blank-faced. Most just turned and walked away. They had wanted to be moved by it. They wouldn't have stood there if they didn't want to believe what they had been told, that it would be a fine thing. But anyone who didn't have a closed mind, which means thinking that anything with the name Picasso connected to it must be wonderful, could see that it was nothing but a big, homely, metal thing. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Some soaring lines, yes, some interesting design, I'm sure. But the fact is, it has a long, stupid face <laughs> and looks like some giant insect that is about to eat a smaller, weaker insect. <laughs> it has eyes that are pitiless, cold, mean. But why not? Everybody said it had the spirit of Chicago. <laughs> And from thousands of miles away, accidentally or on purpose, Picasso captured it. Up there in that ugly face is the spirit of Al Capone, the Somerdale scandal cops, hmm. the settlers who took the Indians but good. Its eyes are like the eyes of every slum owner who made a buck off the small and weak, and of every building inspector who took a wad from a slum owner to make it all possible. It has the look of the dope pusher and of the syndicate technician as he looks for just the right wire to splice the bomb to. Any big time real estate operator will be able to look into that face of the Picasso and see the spirit that makes the city's rebuilding possible and profitable. It has the look of the big corporate executives who comes face to face with the reality of how much water pollution his company is responsible for and then thinks of the profit and loss and of his salary. It's all there in that Picasso thing, the I will spirit, the I will get you before <laughs> you will get me spirit. Picasso has never been here, they say, but you'd think he'd been riding the L his whole life. <laughs> So I'm not sure that every piece of public art can uh, elicit that sort of response, poetic, powerful. It should elicit response. You have not been here that long. You've only been here for three years. I'm going to start this conversation by asking you, what is your favorite piece of public art and why? My favorite? Well, I could just say it's in the lobby of the Inland Steel Building, you know. Good choice. I mean, that, that's a good one that I talked about. I like that because one. Because it's beautiful. Yeah. It is beautiful, and it's so weird. <laughs> I mean, really. And you look at something like that, and, you know, you just wonder, like, what is that doing there? Why is that there? Which is usually why I'm interested in most things. Not because I look at them and say, oh, that's so great but because I wonder. Because it prompts questions yes. and it causes wonder. Exactly. Julia, what about you? This must be a well, hard you know, one for you. You interviewed me once years ago and you asked me my favorite park and I, and at the same, I was having the same thing going on in my head because... Well, you should have been prepared for this. I know, right? right? <laughs> the hell's the matter with you? You have experience thinking, with oh, it. Oh, if I pick one favorite, what about <laughs> the other favorites? But I think my answer, Rick, is the same answer that I gave you. And it's my favorite often has to do with whatever I'm working on at that moment. Sure. Or, and so, um, I mean, of course, when we, were, when we were doing the restoration of the Fountain of Time and I, I was able to get a Save America's Treasures grant, and that's just so cool because you can go inside of that one. But um, one of the more recent projects that I really had the privilege to work on is this statue stories Chicago I hope people know about it the even the um, lions outside of the Art Institute you you can on your smartphone have them call you and so I um, was doing a lot of the grunt work on this project and I said if I have to do all this behind the scenes stuff I want to write one and so I got to write the Humboldt Oh, fabulous. And so in writing von Humboldt I decided I didn't want him to be an old man um, old German guy so there's a little lizard on the back of his book and so the 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 monologue comes from the point of view of the lizard which actually does tie into um, von Humboldt and his travels in Central America so so I'll say that's my favorite. Okay. 
Terry, you can certainly mention one of your own uh, sculptures, but, but before that, I need to know what the eye is made of. Uh, fiberglass. Just you fiberglass. say he says it's like it's a oh, will fiberglass. Fiberglass. Yeah. I, I, I'm not quite sure how it's made, but it's, it's fascinating. Steel, steel, and it's, it's a big steel structure underneath. I, I guess I, I mean, I, and I use a fabricator that makes big boy signs and giant dinosaurs, and so it's of that. I like its uh, relationship to vernacular kind of roadside attractions. All right, what's your favorite piece in Chicago? Um, I'm sure there's a more interesting answer, but I, I love that Calder piece, the big flamingo, because it's just so playful, and it's like a kid made it, and he's this old man, and it just has some spirit of, you know, uh, that kind of modernist, optimistic See, spirit that you know what occurs you know, to me I think you should all do this amongst yourselves too later on is it's very telling to get the answer to that question what is your favorite piece of outdoor sculpture I really do think it's telling about a human being what's your least favorite <laughs> oh. least favorite I don't know you want to know mine? Off the top of your head? Okay, yes. Mine yours. is the Jack Brickhouse so-called sculpture uh, next to the Tribune. It is the most hideous thing. By comparison, the Irv Cups in it statue just down Irving Park uh, it looks like uh, one of the greatest statues ever made. Do you have a least favorite? Do you have one? If you had your chance I... to take one out of Chicago and send it to uh, Milwaukee. <laughs> I, no offense I, to Milwaukee. I'm not going to name a piece, but I don't like the wax museum approach to sculpture. Meaning what? <laughs> right? Where every eyebrow is exactly, where it looks like this little frozen person. And where the, the 19th century artists, when they were doing figurative art, they were so expressive. They captured the spirit of the person instead of worrying <clears throat> about every eyebrow. <laughs> that would look. Do you have a least favorite? I, mean, I know that you admire art of any kind, I would think. But uh, well, you don't I don't want to say because pick an they old could one. be here, yeah. they could be somebody I know. Pick an old one, then. I mean, now, now they're all coming to me. It's like, <laughs> it's like Tourette's. I'm going to say some, a good friend of mine's. Um, well, I love those. When you come down Congress, I'm going to put my, I'm probably going to put my foot in my mouth. Those two Native American kind the of decoy, yeah. yeah. I love those. those and then in the middle of it, there's this kind of red. I don't think that's very well placed. Do you that mean figurative, the, the like fairy? Yes, that's not my favorite. Is she here? Whoever the artist is. <laughs> yeah, she moved back to Alaska. So All right. Well, I yeah, think that's yeah. terrible. <laughs> we're I mean, safe. A piece we're safe. Of crap. We're to be safe. honest with you. We're safe. Yeah, we're going to spend the next 15 minutes just putting shit on artists. <laughs> Uh, let me ask you, Chicago being Chicago, and I, the only intimate time I was involved in this was, uh, was when Lois Weisberg got the cows in here and Peter Hennig of the, the shoe store pay, helped pay for it. But knowing Chicago and knowing that, that the city fathers of this city have never been particularly altruistic when it wasn't for their own benefit, how did these statues get made? We all know, I think, you, we all, the first park ever built in this city was Bug House Square, formerly Washington Square Park. And it was not built because some developer thought it would be a grand idea for people. It was built to enhance the value of the properties he was trying to sell around the park, hence the first park. Why was it? How did these statues get built? Well, and why? So many of the older <coughs> ones were gifts. Um, and so they were either by an, kind of a, an ethnic group that wanted to sort of celebrate an important figure of their, from their homeland, or sometimes from an, inv an individual philanthropist. But that's why I really like that Martin Ryerson piece, yeah. because it was the... Well, so it was a more rarefied uh, version of honorary street names, kind of, is what you're saying. Nicer than honorary. Yeah, right. <laughs> How do you get a piece of outdoor sculpture. If the Nathan Manilow Sculpture Garden at Governor State University, where that amazing Paul Bunyan exists, is, is I, I will say, and I'm sure you will too, it's one of the undiscovered 
yeah, really. joys of the Midwest. It's kind of a land of giants of all manner of different sculptures. How do you get in there? Um, every one of these has been different, honestly. That, you know, there are some things that are like a percentage for art where a, ta a city or mm -hmm. has to somebody, like the, the Sony Rainbow, they built a, Sony built a building and they were, um, <coughs> It, it was, they they had to have a certain percent of that of that budget go towards a public piece. The thing that was really tricky there is it was supposed to be for the public, but it's a walled-in space. It's a oh studio lot. So how do you make something public in this walled-off space? So my brilliant answer was to make something so big <coughs> that you see it from miles around. Oh, that's so a there's great part idea. of it that's practical. That's a great idea. But they're idea. all different. I mean the. The eye was made for a temporary thing for State Street, and there was a, a particular committee that, that actually, I think they taxed some of the, the uh, businesses, um, but it was only temporary, and then some rich oil guy from Dallas saw it, you know, it was in storage for a couple years, and he bought it, and now it's in downtown Dallas. So that's like a private person just bought it, and... Uh, one of the interesting lot. things in this city for me, and you can talk about this, is when I, I am not, I will tell you, I am not a huge fan of the bean. I think it's kind of like, for me, it's kind of like a tourist trap kind of thing. I, okay, we're all different. What I am a fan of are those huge towers that mm -hmm. have faces and spit water. Crown fountain. Mm -hmm. And I see in the summer times especially, I walk over here you know, a couple times a month just to watch kids, black kids, brown kids, yellow kids, all playing in there, which really, to my mind, became a new kind of definition of public art for me. And I look at those kids and then I look and say, God damn it, many of these kids cannot afford to come into this remarkable, place. Mm -hmm. What is the future of remarkable places like this vis-a-vis -vis the expanding kind of nature of public art? What do you, what do you think? Places like, like the, the Art Institute Like the Chicago. Art Institute. Yeah. The Art Institute's responsibility to public art or? No, the future of places like this. Will people, does the future Trump or no, sorry, fucking <laughs> Trump. Uh, Forget that for a second. The kind of money that was necessary to build and build the collections of and house them in relatively not, the public can come in here, but in many places you have to pay to come in here right. to those places. That's what I'm talking about, the future of those sorts of places. Who's going to build a new field museum if they do? Well, you know, I mean, George Lucas. The people building all these new museums are all big private collectors, right? So that's what you do, you know. In L.A., the Broad, you know, you don't want to give your collection to the Art Institute. You build your own museum. I mean, that's definitely but one that, that, that direction. But seems to me to be a kind of a definition of elitism. Well, I mean, I guess in some ways it's better than putting it in a vault where no one can see it, but it's true. I mean, having your name on the museum and it's not, you know, getting mixed in with the collection here, which is definitely one way that you can enhance. I'm just wondering if there's like going this. to be in the next decades of some kind of explosion of public art. You can think of all these statues and sculptures in this town and think, to think to yourself, Jesus, if we put a huge, huge, it would be huge and high roof all over it, it would be the most amazing museum, make every other institution look like a, a storefront art gallery. What do you think about, about I, th I mean, first of all, I think museums have always been based on private collections. No question. I mean, that's what, you know, but I do worry that, I mean, everything is becoming more privatized. I mean, why wouldn't museums? So, I mean, we were just talking before this about un public universities, so it's, it seems like it's the same kind of problem. I think museums, I mean, this is maybe a question for, I, I don't know, I'm not an ex, I'm not a museum person, but um, no, it's, I think it's definitely a, a <coughs> worry that they're just too expensive, you know? Um, what about for, you? For you're, you're, and I think museums are trying to address that. I do too. I but do it's, too. Uh, you know, but I don't, it, that seems to just, like everything else, there's no, 
there's less public, civic, you know, we still have a free zoo, which is cool. Yeah, one of the last <laughs> free zoos in the country, I'm anymore. no kidding. I'm not um, from a museum background, but a lot of people don't realize that the one time that the Art Institute did have a little satellite museum was during the Depression. They were worried that people were working so hard and, you know, it didn't even have the money to, for the car fare to go downtown. And so they opened a little small satellite art institute at the Garfield Park Gold Dome building. It was only there for about three or four years. But I think it is interesting if you look back the last 20 or 25 years that there has been a move to get more art in the neighborhoods. You could argue whether it's as good as a good art or bad. I mean, I, for me, I feel that it's great to do a lot of temporary art because people just don't realize the maintenance costs of taking care of pieces. Yeah. And I think, you know, the current administration of One the of city the really wants I... to have a lot of temporary, they're doing yeah. 50 art, 50 artworks and 50 wards. And I think that's a big push right now. You know, I do know that the Art Institute does amazing kind of outreach and does have free days and does have people in here. But what troubles me about the whole notion, notion of, of public art is, is art is vanishing from the classrooms of public schools that kids are not getting any kind of artistic impression or experience and that's I'm gonna say is that heartbreaking to you too well, of course it's heartbreaking of course it's heartbreaking now when you're teaching kids uh, in school and I know you've only been here three years do you tell them to go out and look you must well I drag them all over the place good <laughs> yeah. good, good. The parks, I hope this is, we're cutting it off, and this nice young lady will meet you at the top of the stairs, those of you who are interested in a tour of something or other, right? Not Mom public cats. art, it's too crummy out, I think it's raining outside. <laughs> but I hope this inspires you to go out and look. You may not have the reaction of Royco, but, uh, and the Nathan Manilow Park at Governor State University and University Park is absolutely worth a day. We're not really taking questions, but you seem intent, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. And then there's Jefferson Park. But the point is, the artist gets a tiny, a little bit of money, and mm -hmm. then it's their money. So this city has a reputation of a lot of sculpture, and everyone thinks the mayor owns it. But it's the artists who are supporting it and doing it for the city, and you're not giving them any recognition. You're not even talking about them. Well, we've just given them some recognition, thanks to you. <laughs> Okay, we have 15 minutes. We have 15 minutes. There's, there's 700 sculptures in this city. I agree with you. Pardon me? Right. But I think it's just great that that's happening because if you look at 20 <clears throat> years ago, you would only see um, sculptures and artworks on the lakefront, and now you're seeing it in every neighborhood. And um, I, you know, I, I can imagine that there's a struggle to find the opportunities, but there were no opportunities, and now there are more and more. So I think it's really becoming a, a thing that people expect in the city. There's so. a whole other conversation about social practice what the Astor Gates is doing on the <coughs> South Side and a lot of other artists, that I think is part of this public, public art conversation, which, you know, there's only so much, that's a whole other series. But I think that is very valid, kind of, there, there's another idea of what public art is. No question, you know, no question. That is Thank more you. temporary and is more local. Uh, thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you. you heard the top of the stairs.